Welcome to the future. PBS Digital. I'm Robert McNeil. Welcome to America at a Crossroads. The Muslim Brotherhood is a charitable organization, a religious movement, and a political party. They wanted to portray themselves as being moderates, but they're masters at the practice of deception. We are sure he has been involved in terrorism financing. Anybody supports Hezbollah here? It's a complex organization, but it also has a very radical, violent element. Every Islamist movement out there in the world today has been influenced by the Brotherhood. Now we meet two journalists investigating ties between the Brotherhood and terrorism. Funding for America at a Crossroads was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Our look at the range of Muslim experience brings us back to Egypt, where the modern jihad movement was born. Also born here was a kind of hybrid organization common in Muslim countries, which combines politics and religion and social services. For instance, here in a suburb of Cairo, the local Sharia committee runs this complex adjoining a mosque which includes a hospital, a school, and an orphanage. Such organizations were inspired by the Muslim Brotherhood, which is banned as a political party, but allowed to have independent members of parliament elected. Because of its popular social services, in an open election, the Brotherhood might win, but declare an Islamic state. So the government won't let it win, and Washington winks because Egypt is an ally, and recognizes the state of Israel. A related group, Hamas, recently won a popular election in Palestine. Hamas does not recognize Israel and embraces violence, which the US labels terrorism. But does the Brotherhood back terrorism? That is very difficult to pin down, as two investigative reporters from Newsweek magazine discover. If you fight, only fight against those who are fighting you. And don't do any aggression, because Allah does not love aggressors. Last October, Kamal Hilbali went to London's Heathrow Airport to catch a plane to New York, where he had been invited to speak at an academic conference. As soon as the plane was ready to take off, my name was called. Please come to the front of the aeroplane. Some gentleman would like to talk to you. As soon as I came off, the door was closed and the plane took off. Hilbawi had visited America before. This time, the authorities wouldn't let him in and wouldn't explain why. He's a prominent member of an international Islamic movement called the Muslim Brotherhood. It wants to create a worldwide Islamic state. But today, there's growing suspicion about the movement's methods. They wanted to portray themselves as being moderates, but they're masters at the practice of deception. And lying to your enemies is a good thing. The Brotherhood has two very different faces. It runs charities in the Muslim world and takes part in some elections. But one supporter has been linked to the 9-11 hijackers. Another is in jail in America, implicated in a plot to assassinate a Saudi prince. While this Brotherhood leader stands accused of financially supporting Al-Qaeda. They're saying you handled money for bin Laden after 9-11. Is that true? Definitely it is not true. Can you imagine it? In this program, Newsweek reporters Mark Hosenball and Michael Isikoff investigate claims that the Muslim Brotherhood and some of its supporters are closely linked to international terrorism. They have an incredibly violent past. There are clerics associated with the Muslim Brotherhood that, that advocate suicide bombings. There is no question that there is a very militant uh, aspect to this organization. We watch it closely.
It's not just one member of the Muslim Brotherhood who's been banned from the country. The fact is that the US government over the last several years has banned several prominent members of the Muslim Brotherhood from entering the United States. When you ask the government, why are you keeping these people out? They say, aha, secret intelligence information. Which leaves them and the rest of us in the dark as to why this is happening. Yet when you talk to people in the Muslim Brotherhood, they say, we have nothing to do with violence. We have nothing to do with terrorism. In fact, that's exactly what this guy Hal Bowie told me when I went to see him in London. Terrorism is, is an attack on humanity, on human people. It's an attack on Muslims and the Muslim, and we should not accept it. So you would not have supported the attacks in America on September 11th? Because it's a part of our belief that this should not happen at all. Everyone knows uh, that the Muslim brothers are not terrorists. Everyone knows. But the fact is that some of the most violent Islamist groups in the world have their roots in the Brotherhood, they take their cues from the Brotherhood, and certainly share the Muslim Brotherhood's core beliefs, which is that Islam is a gift from God and eventually will take over the world. The Muslim Brotherhood was formed 80 years ago in Egypt. Its desire to spread a fundamental form of Islam has included the use of violence. In 1948, a Muslim brother assassinated the Egyptian prime minister. The prime minister was shot by a fanatical assassin, a student who felt that the ruler had given away the Sudan and Palestine and had dissolved the extremist Muslim Brotherhood and therefore deserved to die. Throughout its history, there have been those within the movement who, depending on the circumstances they face, have decided that violence is a, in a, a, uh, an appropriate method by which to pursue the movement's goals. In 1954, a Brotherhood supporter tried to kill Jamal Nasser, the Egyptian president, this time without success. The Muslim Brotherhood was originally set up to counter what they perceived to be the secularizing effects of modern states as they emerged in the Muslim world. The core ideology is the idea that, that Islam should pervade every aspect of one's life. The man who championed that ideology in the 1950s and 60s was Syed Qutb, one of the Brotherhood's most radical thinkers. Said Qutb is an incredibly influential figure throughout all of the contemporary Islamist movements. Qutb had visited the West and took a very strong stand against its secular ideas. He saw the West as essentially depraved and he said, we had reached a point in the world where it was impossible for Muslims to live truly as m Muslims because the world is ruled by secular capitalist imperial infidels. The only way for you to make a difference then is to take up arms against them. You have to directly confront those oppressors. The Said Qutb vision is central to the teachings that were given to those that were recruited for the 9-11 hijackings. Osama bin Laden and his mentor Abdullah Azam were all members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Osama bin Laden participated in Muslim Brotherhood meetings in Saudi Arabia. They all share the Muslim Brotherhood DNA and that ideology. Wow, do you see this, this aircraft? That is it. This is terrorist. A major disaster is occurring in New York City this morning. Actually, the U.S. government only became co really concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood after the 9-11 attacks when they began to be concerned about its influence on international jihadi movements. That's right, and what really got them interested was that Syrian guy in Germany who was associating with the 9-11 hijackers. Yeah, the Syrian guy is Mamun Darkazanli, and uh, he moved to Germany from Syria in the early 1980s. Back in Syria, he had been a member of a particularly violent faction of the Brotherhood. How do we know that? Well, I was told that by intelligence sources on both sides of the Atlantic. What really caught my attention to this guy, though, was when President Bush, about a week after 9-11, declared him publicly to be an international terrorist financier. And then I ran across this intriguing video in which he's shown socializing on a particularly festive occasion with the 9-11 hijackers. <laughs> 
The videotape was found by police in the Hamburg apartment of one of those wanted for supporting the 9-11 hijackers. It showed a Muslim wedding ceremony. Marwan Ashehi was there. He flew the second plane into the World Trade Center. So was Zia Jera, who piloted United Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania. And Ramzi bin El Sheib, allegedly one of the planners of September the 11th. Also present in the audience, small but clearly distinguishable, was the Syrian businessman Mamoun Darkazanli. The more I looked into Darkazanli, the more I wanted to know about the role the Muslim Brotherhood played in supporting terrorism. Rosenbal and Isakov flew to Hamburg to discover more about Mamoun Darkazanli's connection to the Brotherhood and to the violent jihadi movement. Darkazanli arrived in Hamburg from Syria in 1983. He set up a company that shipped goods in and out of Germany. But behind Darkazanli's professional life lay a radical past. American intelligence officials believe that in the 1980s, he took part in a violent uprising against the Syrian government, led by the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood in Syria was a militant organization. They had a very clearly defined aim, and that was an Islamic state. It fought for an Islamic state in Syria and nothing more. The brutal secular regime of Syrian dictator Hafez Assad was a natural enemy of the Brotherhood. To them, Assad was backed by atheistic communists of the Soviet Union, and Darkazanli and the Brotherhood sought to replace his regime with a government based on fundamental Islamic values. The main characteristic of that Islamic state would be an introduction of the Sharia law, meaning the Islamic law restricting the roles of women, introducing traditional legal codes of the Muslim Middle Ages and so on. The Brotherhood's fight to Islamize Syria failed. The Syrian dictator crushed the rebels. Thousands died. Many Muslim brothers, like Darkazandli, went into exile. Brutal repression radicalizes young Muslims. As soon as violence became more widespread, many militant groups split from it. So they, the, the Brotherhood spawned offshoots Yes, yes, you might say so. And these small radical groups were the ones later to have connections into, uh, into Al-Qaeda. And I suspect that Darkazanli was a member of these smaller, more radical groups. Darkazanli's link to terrorism has never been proved in a court of law. But circumstantial connections to two major terrorist attacks against the West and to Osama bin Laden have raised suspicions about his actions. In 1998, the US embassies in Tanzania and Kenya were attacked with suicide bombs. Over 200 people were killed. US investigators blamed Al Qaeda. They came across Darkazanli's name on a document giving him control over a German bank account of one of the bombing suspects. Another suspect had been handing out business cards listing an address that turned out to be Darkazanli's apartment in Hamburg. Intelligence agents then turned up a second possible link between Darkazanli and the violent jihadi movement. Manfred Merck is the deputy director of the local intelligence agency in Hamburg. So what's the story on Merck? Merck is German counterintelligence in Hamburg, and their job is to watch extremist movements. Right, and you met him after 9-11. I met him after 9-11, uh, but I only talked to him off the record then. After the embassy bombing attacks, intelligence agents discovered that years earlier, Darka Zanli might have supplied equipment to the Al-Qaeda leader. So Darka Zanli was well known as somebody who had a uh, import-export company uh, in Hamburg uh, and somebody who might have supported Osama bin Laden by doing this. 
by buying a, a ship, Jennifer, uh, uh, that was uh, later on supposed to, uh, to work for uh, Osama bin Laden. At the time, it was not a criminal offense in Germany to support a foreign terrorist organization, so Darka Zanli was not arrested. But before 9-11, he was being watched. And German agents found a third possible link between Mamoun Darkazanli and the jihadi movement. They had seen him meet with other radical Islamists in Hamburg. One of them led agents to an address, number 54 Marienstrasse, the apartment that, after 9-11, would become notorious. So 54 Marienstrasse, this is where it all began. Yeah, this is the house of death. And up there on the first floor is the apartment of death where the 9-11 hijackers lived. This is where they plotted the 9-11 attacks. But of course, they didn't figure that out until after 9-11. Uh, when they banged in the door, right? Which, yeah, you uh, can still see where the police kicked see. in the door. Right. Yeah, that's right. And how does Dark and Zanley fit in with this? Well. The authorities know that he knew the people who lived in this building, the, the hijackers, but they, they don't really know what his involvement was in the 9-11 plot. Do you think Darkin Zanli was connected to the 9-11 plot? Uh, I think that he took a part uh, in mobilizing, in recruiting uh, the Hamburg cell. He did have personal connections, I think, to almost every member uh, of the cell. He had business relations to really important Al-Qaeda members here in Europe. So you believe he knew a lot more about the attacks than he's ever admitted? Yes, yes, of course. Three years after 9-11, a Spanish judge claimed to have found yet another connection between Mamoun Darkazanli, international terrorism, and the Muslim Brotherhood. The Spanish actually conducted a pretty thorough investigation. They recovered some sort of picture of Darka Zanli against a setting of what looks like Afghanistan uh, in a pose with a Kalashnikov rifle, a machine gun. So that suggests he has some sort of jihadi sympathies. Also, the Spanish say Darka Zanli had dealings with important jihadi type figures in, in Spain. One of them is a guy named uh, Imad Yarkas, a.k.a. Abu Dada. Right, he's actually a, a pretty significant player. He's the guy they caught on wiretap before 9-11 talking about the head of the bird is about to get cut off. Yeah, which of course was a very kind of spooky statement, only it didn't make any sense before 9-11. Spanish investigators claimed that Abu Dada, Darkazanli's alleged contact in Spain, was part of a support cell for 9-11 that was linked to the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood. He is now serving a 12-year jail sentence for belonging to Al-Qaeda. Like Darka Zanli, Abu Dada is also from Syria. It became only clear, uh, I think, after September 11th, that such a network existed, a network of Syrians. All these are Syrians who were born in the late 1950s, early 1960s, then took part in the insurgency in Syria against the Syrian regime at the end of the 1970s, early 1980s, left for Europe, and then later on became important figures in the logistics networks uh, of Al-Qaeda. They grew out of the Muslim Brotherhood, and Dar Kazani was one of these guys. In 2004, the Spanish judge issued an arrest warrant for Dar Kazanli, accusing him of being a member of Al-Qaeda. He was jailed while his lawyer battled to prevent his extradition to Spain. Eventually, Germany's highest court rejected the Spanish warrant because they said it violated German law. Darka Zanli was free again. Mamun Darka Zanli has turned down several requests we made to interview him. So Hosenball and Isakov went to his apartment to try one last time to speak with him. So this is a pretty nice neighborhood where uh, Mr. Darkin Zanli lives, uh, actually. Uh, I think this is probably like one of the poshest neighborhoods in all of Hamburg. It must have done pretty well by that uh, import-export business. Yeah, selling boats and stuff like that. Are we ready? Yeah. 
Hallo, Herr Dachesanli. Uh, ich bin Journalist Mark Hosenball und, und ich bin hier mit meinem Kollegen uh, Michael Isakoff von Washington DC. Doc Zanley said he'd think about giving an interview if we gave him further information about the reporters in the project. It's very hard to hear him. Yeah. He got the information, but still refused to go on camera. The suspicions about Doc Zanley's actions plus the way that some Brotherhood beliefs have been used to justify violent attacks against Western targets, have helped to make the movement a cause of concern within the U.S. government. Is this a um, moderate organization, uh, ultimately peaceful, that can be engaged in, um, in, in issues of importance to the United States, or is it a foundation uh, f uh, for the inspiration of terrorism. It's a complex organization. It has a social and civic nature to it, which goes to the first part of your question. Uh, but it also has a very radical violent element. Where do you think the balance lies in their behavior today, on the violent side or on the peaceful side? Well, it's interesting. As you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is not a designated foreign terrorist organization. Because the U.S. government doesn't consider it to be a terrorist organization, a terrorist organization per se. That's right. Are there individuals that we believe are support violent activity? Uh, have we designated them or taken action against them? Absolutely. Shortly after 9-11, a business with very close links to the Muslim Brotherhood found itself on the receiving end of one of those designations. One of the first groups the U.S. government made a big fuss about was this Swiss-based financial network called al Taqwa, which in Arabic means fear of God. Yeah, that's the bank that's run along strict Islamic lines, and Bush himself described it as an important source of funds for al-Qaeda. Today we are taking another step in our fight against the evil. I'll talk with that have helped Al Qaeda shift money around the world. They present themselves as legitimate businesses, but they skim money from every transaction for the benefit of terrorist organizations. By shutting these networks down, we disrupt the murderer's work. Now the person who set up and ran the Al Taqwa network was this guy. Yusuf Nada, he's one of the Brotherhood's most important personalities, and his history with the movement goes back decades. Yusuf Nada joined the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood in the late 1940s, when the country was gripped by violent protests against British colonial rule. Thousands of Brotherhood activists were rounded up, among them Yusuf Nada. At the time, he was part of the organization's military wing. He had to go to jail, he was tortured, he was beaten by the Egyptian police because he was a, a Muslim Brotherhood activist from a very young age. Uh, so it tells you something about the, the, the lengthiness and the depth of his uh, engagement with the, with the Brotherhood. So uh, what do you think the odds are not is going to talk to us? Well, last time, few times I've talked to him, he's been very friendly. He, he said to me, I said to him at one point, I might want to come and talk to you down at your house. And he said, oh, you are welcome, Mr. Husenball, he said. So uh, you, have, you have his home number? I, of course I have his home number. I have his home number, his mobile number, his children's number. I, I actually, I got his address book, actually. <laughs> Let's see what well, we can do. go ahead. Is this Mr. Nada? Oh, this is Hosenball here, Mark Hosenball, from Washington. Oh, I'm very well today, Mr. Nada. How are you doing? Are you still alive? Well, that's, uh, that's encouraging. <laughs> Nada has lived in exile from his homeland, Egypt, since 1960. He agrees to be interviewed. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Nada. I hope to see you then. OK, bye. Bye. The headquarters of Yusuf Nada's financial network was set among the alpine hills and valleys of Lugano in Switzerland. 
Lugano, the yes. uh, banking paradises. Switzerland, in general, is a place where it's very easy to open a bank account with banking secrecy. That's an ideal place to set up a bank if you want to carry out certain activities. So this is the offices of the bank Altaqua, but you couldn't actually walk in off the street and deposit your money, could you? No, it wasn't really that kind of bank. In fact, arguably, it wasn't even a bank at all. It was just a bunch of guys in one of the offices up there with telephones and computers, which they used to move money around the world through other banks. So whose money are they moving? Well, Muslim brothers, wealthy friends of Muslim brothers, people who learned about the bank through Islamic contacts. Bank Altaqwa was the main bank of the Muslim Brotherhood network in Europe, providing a lot of money to uh, Muslim Brotherhood mosques and Islamic centers throughout Europe, and according to the US government, also providing money to terrorist activities, to Al Qaeda and other groups. Yusef Nada's home is just a few miles away from the building in Lugano that once housed his Altaqwa headquarters. His well-appointed villa is in Campione, a small piece of Italian territory surrounded on all sides by Switzerland. When you imagine what an Islamist activist is like, you would imagine someone like uh, Bin Laden with a long beard in, in, a, in a cave somewhere. But Nada was not at all like that. I mean, he was a very refined, very educated person. He admitted of be, being basically the foreign minister of the Muslim Brotherhood. He was negotiating between different governments in the Arab world and different Islamist groups on behalf of the Brotherhood. In 1991, he tried to see Saddam Hussein uh, to tell him to avert war with the US. This is actually a really amazing place. Villa Nada. You've called your membership in the Muslim Brotherhood the greatest honor of my life. That's true. Still. Yes. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because I believe that what they are doing, what they are looking for, what they are spreading is something noble. But, but is the Muslim Brotherhood actually, it's an organization, isn't it? It started organization. Now it is a way of thinking, built on morals. Right. I don't cheat, I don't steal, I don't kill. But ultimately, one of the goals of the Brotherhood is to proselytize, to spread Islam around the world. Naturally. And to establish an Islamic state. Not to establish, to assist. To assist. To the establishment of the Islamic state. And one Islamic state for all the world. Yes, but you, uh, if you uh, want to dream, yes. But if you want to do what is available and what is practical, do it wherever you can. But does the mother, Muslim Brotherhood believe in terrorism? The mother, no, no. The well, we condemn that not because we are afraid, because it is against our belief. But Nada's denials did not prevent suspicions growing about his intentions and about the connections of his Al Taqwa financial network to terrorist violence. His choice of business partners at Al Taqwa didn't really help matters either. They were a very unusual group of people. The bank's religious advisor was Sheikh Yusuf Al Karadawi, one of the most prominent preachers in Islam. Indeed, he's a regular commentator on Al Jazeera, and he's known for issuing some rather provocative fatwas. So provocative, in fact, that at some point they got him banned from the United States. Karadawi has publicly supported the insurgency in Iraq and praised suicide bombers in Israel as Palestinian martyrs. Then there was Ahmed Huber, a director of one of the Al Taqwa businesses, a Swiss convert to Islam. He's been closely linked to European neo-Nazi groups. Well, he's reputed to be an admirer of Adolf Hitler. Well, he's not just reputed to be. I interviewed him once, and he told me that every week 
He went to a meeting in the hills around Bern with the current descendants of the Hitler Youth Movement. Rather strange company, I'd say. But the most controversial of Nada's Altaqwa partners was an Eritrean businessman named Ahmed Idris Nasreddin. Nasreddin was also a key financial backer of a mosque in Milan that the American government described as one of Al-Qaeda's most important bases in Europe. So Nada is essentially in business with somebody who's financing a mosque that's arguably breeding terrorists. Right, and that's one of the reasons why the US government and other authorities have been so intent on looking into the Bank al Takwa. The Swiss investigation of al Takwa led to a police raid on Nada's home and offices a few weeks after the 9-11 attacks. The authorities were looking for documents to prove that the bank had, as the American government claimed, in financing terrorist organizations. Boxes and boxes of papers were carted away. Among them was found a document written in Arabic, which some investigators believe is the Brotherhood's political manifesto. It raises further questions about the links between the movement and violence. They outline their plan for a global takeover, uh, starting from the creation of the Islamic family, to the Islamic state, to the Islamic world. And they'll do it through violence in certain places uh, and by playing politics in other places. The document spells out the methods of establishing what it calls Islamic rule on earth. Supporters are instructed to use surveillance systems to gather information to collaborate with movements engaged in jihad in the Islamic world and nations with an Islamic minority, and to secure sufficient funds to help those movements. It's not written on the document that is a Muslim Brotherhood document, but it's, it's clear in its content. Uh, the ideology of the document is the Muslim Brotherhood ideology. Um, and if you find this document in his home, it means that uh, it's a Muslim Brotherhood document, basically. Nada says the paper was just one of hundreds sent to him and is of little importance. He disputes its authenticity. Do you know where this came from? No, no way. But the document was found in the raid on your premises. You call it document, they call it documents. I call it is a paper was here, either it was a research or it was a, an article, I don't know. So you don't know how the document came to Again, be Again, you'll repeat your question. I'm just saying. I repeat the same answer if you want the repetition. <laughs> but you said before, one of the goals of the Muslim Brotherhood is to assist in the creation of an Islamic State. And that is the same goal that's outlined in this document, if, to establish analyze, an Islamic State. If you analyze the document, some of it are ours and some of it are not ours. It doesn't mean that all of it is ours, but not violence. What not part, killing, what part of what not lies? terrorism. But wait a second. Isn't Hamas the Palestinian branch of the brothers? Well, it is true, they are. Hamas is now the elected government in Palestine. It opposes Israel's right to exist on what it regards as Islamic land and is fighting to eradicate the Jewish state. Hamas militants have launched numerous suicide bombings against Israeli civilians. But Hamas endorses suicide bombing, violence. Why to talk about Hamas and not to talk about what the Israelis are doing with Hamas? Do you think that suicide bombing is a legitimate no, self-defense No, I don't say that it is legitimate. But I can say that it is understandable. A bad reaction for bad actions. Do you think that suicide bombing in Iraq by Iraqis against the Americans, is that justified? If it is resistant, any resistance to the occupier is accepted. Those who stand up against the occupier, they are partisans. After the raids on Nada's home and offices, the Swiss authorities conducted a lengthy criminal investigation into his activities. Nada wasn't arrested, but the police did question him. Nada was extraordinarily determined not to give too many information to the Swiss investigators. He says, I've known prison, I've known jail, I've been beaten, and 
they will not be able to extract any information from me. The Swiss were looking for clear evidence that Nada's financial network had funded terror attacks. They knew the Americans had a big dossier on Nada. And the Swiss asked them what they knew. They received a reply from the US Treasury. Mark Hosenball has acquired a copy of the still confidential letter. It appears to be a damning indictment of Nada and the Al Taqwa network. Well, this letter is pretty interesting. It says that. $60 million collected annually from Hamas went to Al Taqwa. It alleges that even after September 11th, bin Laden and his Al Qaeda organization received financial assistance from Yusuf M. Nada. And it says that Bank Al Taqwa appeared to be providing a clandestine line of credit for a close associate of Osama bin Laden. What do they mean by a clandestine line of credit? One of the founders of Al Qaeda had a secret bank account at Al Taqwa. The U.S. government said that in 1997 it was reported that 60 million collected annually for Hamas from all parts of the world went well, to we Al never had that's, any. That's we never had any contact, financially or not financially, as Bank Al Taqwa with Hamas. So Bank Al Taqwa never dealt with any money from Hamas. Not by any way. Not a single penny came or went to Hamas. The U.S. government said that you received money that pours in for, from Kuwait and United Emirates for Osama bin Laden. Is that true? Never. And how could it happen? It says here even as of late September 2001. So huh? that's after the 9-11 attacks. Can you imagine even after, after 11 September? Right. That's what they're saying. They're, they're saying you handled money for bin Laden after 9-11. Is that true? Pretty strange Definitely to me. Definitely it is not true. Can you imagine it? raiding my house, and I'm still receiving money or giving money to Bin Laden, and all this testimony is false. It says that a senior associate of Bin Laden had a, a secret password protected never, account in Al-Qaeda. It's just untrue. Never. Where did they get this from then? You ask me, ask them. So you never had any contact with Osama Bin Laden? Never. You never had any contact never. with Al-Qaeda? Absolutely. Absolutely. Neither he nor Al-Qaeda nor, nor the, the Taliban. So basically you're saying that Every single thing in this letter from the United States Treasury Department about you is false. For me, not only false, I don't say only it is false. I said I challenge anyone to prove any of what is written there. One big obstacle facing the Swiss investigators of the Al Taqwa network was what they claim was a suspicious lack of key financial records. The financial records of Bank Al Taqwa almost entirely disappeared. The Swiss investigators learned that the records were probably somewhere in Saudi Arabia. But Nada always refused to give any precise information about where the documents could be. But isn't it true that a lot of your records were missing? No. Your records were sent to Saudi Arabia. No, that we had our records in Saudi Arabia, that is true. But he said it was missing. Missing in what? Which documents which he's, he's looking for? Well, it says in here, this is the Swiss prosecutor's letter to you. It says, La comptabilité de la banque El Taqwa se trouve quelque part en Arabie Saoudite à une adresse que les deux prévenus se gardent bien well, de communiquer. Well, he's trying to case. find the excuse he's, for his failure. But he's saying that you were holding out on him because you wouldn't tell him where the books that were means, in Saudi Arabia. That means he doesn't have the proof. He wants me to prove to him. Yeah, but that's the way prosecutors normally work. Without the documents Nada refused to retrieve from Saudi Arabia, Swiss investigators were stuck. They pressed Washington for more evidence. The Americans had made strong allegations against Nada, and now the Swiss asked the US to come up with the information. Yeah, the Swiss became really furious at the American government because they kept sending requests for information. All they told them in the end was to look at some press clippings and search the internet. So for all the rhetoric about cracking down on the financiers of terror, the administration never really got its act together. Not in this case, anyway.
The U.S. Treasury Department declined to be interviewed in this program. It told us that it is pursuing an aggressive strategy to cut off the flow of funds to terrorists and is doing all it can to detect and disrupt their financial lines of support. Yusef Nada is not facing criminal charges in the West, but he isn't exactly a free man either. The Security Council of the United Nations has closed his businesses and frozen his assets. If he tries to travel from his Italian enclave to another country, even to neighboring Switzerland, the UN says he must be turned back. Until recently, Victor Comras was responsible for monitoring the way these sanctions are operating for the United Nations. Now, Nada goes around claiming uh, that he's completely innocent. He's a, he says, I'm an Islamist, I'm a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, I'm not a terrorist. Do you believe him? No. Right. We are damn sure that he has uh, been involved in terrorism financing. I think he was one of the key players. He was one of the principal cogs that promoted terrorism financing. But the evidence of his involvement in the financing of terrorism is essentially secret. Uh, it is uh, largely intelligence information, yes. And that makes it difficult because when you're hiding your sources and methods, it's extremely difficult to make a case against the terrorism financier. It's a question of threat to the United States. The United States didn't take action alone. Other countries agreed to that action. But when an individual says to us, they've shut me down, I can't do business, uh, I can't go anywhere because of these secret charges that have been leveled against uh, me by the United States government. The United States government is not prepared to put into the public arena. No, th that's right. Now, is there a means by which you can challenge whether it's our asset freezings or the watch? You can challenge it, and there's an administrative and legal review process that it goes through. If we, as you know, if we had to make public every piece of information we had on which we rely to assess threats, there would be no secrets, and it's just not good security policy to do that. But presumably, if you had enough evidence against these people, you might even try and bring cases against them in the United States courts. And it looks like you're sort of applying a double standard here, and to some extent. But, but, it, but it, and I agree with you that it, in the sense that if we had enough to bring a criminal case, it's fair to presume that we would bring it. Um, but it's not our only tool and we're not limited in that way. And so we've created additional tools to allow us to take, to, to take some action even where we can't make a criminal case. Bottom line, no evidence against them. Absolutely. They found a lot to prove that I'm Islamist. I don't, uh, I don't deny that. I'm proud to be Islamist but not to resist. <laughs> and proud to be Muslim brother. Uh, naturally. The Swiss closed its investigation into Youssef Nada and his al taqwa network in 2005. But the Brotherhood's own website says that the Egyptian government has now charged Nada with money laundering and plans to try him in absentia. So there's little doubt that the Brotherhood and some of its leaders have inspired Islamic extremists around the world. And the US and other Western governments insist prominent Brotherhood members are financing terrorism. But the big question is, how extensive is their influence here in the United States? There's no group that calls itself the Muslim Brotherhood per se. But there are people who are aligned with the Brotherhood who have been showing up in some pretty interesting places. The Muslim Brotherhood is a, an organization that uh, uh, has a large following in the United States that's getting larger. Uh, they have lobbying organizations, charity organizations. They have businesses also. And they want to portray themselves as being moderates. Uh, when in fact, uh, if you scratch the surface, they are front organizations for the Muslim Brotherhood to carry out their long-term goals. Yet they would not acknowledge their association or affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood. Absolutely not. So what individual Americans has the FBI been looking at? Well, one guy in particular is this guy, Abdul Rahman Alamudi. 
You may recall he's the guy who comes to this country in 1979. He's from Eritrea. And he forms a whole bunch of political uh, organizations, civic organizations. And by the late 1990s, he's sort of looked at as one of, if not the leading spokesman for the Muslim community in this country. And what's his connection to the Brotherhood? Well, law enforcement officials tracking his statements, tracking his activities, uh, have strongly suspected for some time that he is, if not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, certainly acting in concert with them. And of course, Nada basically confirmed this to us himself when we interviewed him in Campione. You did know this guy, Abdurrahman al Amudi, did you? I know him. You, knew him. you met him personally? I'm not sure. Was he a member of the Brotherhood? Yes and no also. What do you mean, yes and no? He is not a member, but he he adapts to all our way of thinking. So how militant is Alamuni? Well, there are two sides to him. There's uh, a public side in which he's a sort of mainstream figure with uh, somewhat liberal views. Uh, to the Muslim community, I want to say it loud and clear that Muslims in the United States of America do not condone, condone violence. We are against violence. We are against terrorism. And then there's another more radical side to Alan Moody, one that he showed only when he thought the rest of the world wasn't looking. Here's a home video of another speech Alan Moody gave right here in Washington. I have been labeled by the media in New York to be a supporter of Hamas. Anybody support this Hamas here? Yeah. We are all supporters of Hamas. Allah I think that in Alamudi's mind, there would have been no contradiction between dining with the creme de la creme of Washington political society one evening and then appearing at a rally in support of Hamas and Hezbollah the next day. How? Because for him, Hamas is primarily a national liberation struggle of the Palestinian people fought against the foreign occupation of the state of Israel. It's not terrorism for him. Wouldn't most of these politicians have been horrified if they knew that he was out there saying Viva Hezbollah, Viva Hamas? Yeah, I think many of them would, yes. But Al Moody presented himself as the representative of a moderate, peaceful brand of Islam. And by doing so, he gained access to the very highest levels of the US government. He knew how to walk the walk and talk the talk. He knew how to communicate with American politicians. He knew how to pat him on the back and smoke cigars, talk about the Dallas Cowboys and the Washington Redskins. American politicians were trying to cultivate moderate Muslims, and they were won over by Ala Moody's professions of peace. In 1999, Ala Moody was invited to the White House to meet President Bill Clinton. The purpose was to communicate the message of Ala Moody as being tolerant and very moderate and to being the voice of Islam to the U.S. government. The White House had little reason to question Alamudi's credentials because he was also working closely with the American military. A group established by Alamudi had been given the job of selecting Islamic chaplains to serve Muslims in the U.S. armed forces. And ultimately we find that it was the Muslim Brotherhood that was, that was certifying Muslim chaplains for the U.S. military. I wish they added that I'm also a supporter of Hezbollah. Anybody supports Hezbollah here? Yeah. yeah, that was a problem. Sensing that power might be about to change in the year 2000, Alan Moody forged a relationship with Grover Norquist, the conservative Republican activist. He even provided seed money for an Islamic institute founded by Norquist to encourage American Muslims to support the Republican Party. Much of the agenda of the American right in terms of social conservatism, family values, etc., that's very much the agenda of the M M Muslim br Brotherhood. So I think he was trying to make the case that, that there were shared goals between the American right and the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Alamudi's cultivation of Norquist bore fruit when he attended a meeting with presidential candidate George Bush and his political advisor, Karl Rove. The Republicans wanted the Muslim vote. Alamudi urged Bush to end the use of secret evidence against Arab Americans in terrorist court cases. His lobbying paid off. Arab Americans are racially profiled in what's called secret evidence. Uh, and uh, we got to do something about that law to make sure that you know, Arab Americans are treated with respect. Despite his private sympathies for Middle East groups the American government regarded as terrorists, Alamudi apparently convinced the future U.S. president of his good credentials. At the same time, Alamudi was going to conferences in Beirut in, uh, in 2001. Uh, with members of Hamas it was held to unite all of the, the terrorist organizations in the Middle East, many of which had a, uh, a Muslim Brotherhood connection, to unite them against Israel and unite them against the West. Alamudi got access to the highest levels of the American government. Yeah, and his performance was convincing enough that the American political leaders were persuaded that he was actually on their side. And his influence actually might have grown even more if he hadn't slipped up in 2003 when he got linked to an international murder plot. And a pretty bizarre plot at that. And when he was arrested, some people said, I, I thought he was a liberal Democrat. Uh, so he must have been very good at this kind of deception. The plot sounded like something out of a spy novel. Alamudi held clandestine meetings with Libyan leader Muammar al-Qaddafi. And Qaddafi's agents handed Alamudi a briefcase full of cash at a London hotel. Qaddafi had had a major disagreement with Crown Prince Abdullah, now the king of Saudi Arabia. U.S. prosecutors say that Libyans paid Alamudi to organize Abdullah's assassination. Do liberal Democrats uh, engage in this kind of, you know, conspiracy? No. Right. His real views are suggested by his participation in this, this insane plot to assassinate the crown prince. In 2004, Alamudi pled guilty to breaking U.S. sanctions against Libya, concealing financial transactions with the country, and making false statements to the immigration authorities. He also admitted his role in the assassination plot. Alamudi was sentenced to 23 years in prison. Is it fair to say that the United States government was a little slow to understand the nature of the Muslim Brotherhood? I would say definitely. Um, all of us were. They were communicating a message. Uh, they were creating an ideology uh, which um, incrementally could lead to, to violence. They were one of the main uh, ingredients leading, I think, to violence against the West and, and to the problems that we're seeing today. Senior members of the Brotherhood take issue with such portrayals of the movement. They feel such opinions are making it more difficult to bring peace to the Middle East. We are not the enemies of the United States. But mistakes in the administrations are very big and affecting all the world, not only the Muslims. We are open for discussion. The day will come when the United States will have to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood. It will come the day, definitely. And if, if they want to be in peace in this area. For the present, though, the Bush administration is adamant. There can be no dialogue with the Muslim Brotherhood until the movement takes a clear, unambiguous stand against terrorism. If a member of the Muslim Brotherhood were in Washington today and wanted to meet with you, would you meet with them? No. Why not? Because I think while there are elements of that organization, they're advocating the use of violence. Uh, and there has been no clear renunciation and rejection of violence as a means to meet their objectives, I would not meet with them. You can't hold in reserve the threat of violence, whether it's in the Palestinian territories or it's in Cairo. You must renounce it and reject it. That's incumbent upon the Muslim Brotherhood to do that if what they want is engagement. 
The problem with the Muslim Brotherhood is that it's this amorphous, sprawling movement that takes so many different forms. That's right. It's a charitable organization, it's a religious movement, and it's an open political party in many countries. But prominent supporters of the movement are also under suspicion for supporting acts of terrorism. So that's the dilemma. Is this an organization that the U.S. government has to deal with, or should it be shunned at all costs? But governments almost always end up talking to those they once castigated as terrorists. Just look at how we're now friends with Libya's Gaddafi. That's true. So even though U.S. officials might not like the philosophy or tactics of the Brotherhood, sooner or later, they're probably going to have to deal with them. Find interactive maps, discussion guides, and more about America at a crossroads at pbs.org. Funding for America at a Crossroads was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.